the idea of the panel today is that we, we really want to just come at, try and kind of understand what is the legislation. ICOs are starting to pick up again, uh, thanks to the price of Ethereum and Bitcoin. I'm sure everybody knows about that. And what are the, if you're a company, if you're a startup, if you're a VC, what are the implications in terms of uh, legal legislation, in terms of what, what will the SEC do? What are the jurisdictions which are more favorable for ICOs or perhaps less favorable? And these are the things that we want to hear from our panelists today. So the first question, uh, which I have, and uh, I'm going to open this one up. And in February, uh, the chairman of the SEC, Mr. Jay Clayton, he actually mentioned that all the ICOs he's seen are uh, securities, all right? And either he's seen very few ICOs or they, perhaps they are. And uh, if I could just ask Adam, maybe you'd like to start with that one. Hi, uh, my name is Adam Jaradovac with Jaradovac Law in Palo Alto, California. And, you know, I agree with the statement that he did say where all of the ICOs that he's seen have been securities. Because if you think about it at a large scale, the ICOs that have been reaching the public media, that have been reaching the grasp of the government, have been the big scams and defrauders. So the ICOs that he's been able to touch, the ICOs that, he's been, that have been piquing his interests, have been securities that are distributed against U.S. securities laws. And in my beliefs, almost every single ICO that you've heard of as well are securities too. Okay, um, does uh, anybody have any other thoughts on that? David, maybe. Yeah, uh, so I don't know how much people in this room know about U.S. securities law, but just to give you guys a 10,000 foot view on why he would say that. So in the U.S., in a security, there's this test called the Howey test, and basically looks at an offering and says, is this a security or is this a product? And what every ICO has been wrestling so far is whether or not they're giving you enough utility that they're not a security or whether or not they're a security. The reason they all want to avoid U.S. securities laws is they're pretty draconian in terms of how you can offer and trade tokens. So if you're a security in the U.S., you're not listing on an exchange, you're not trading after you're listed. So it, it's going to significantly reduce the amount of money you can raise in an ICO. And so when Clayton's coming out and making statements saying, I think every single ICO is a security, what he's doing is he's applying 60 years of U.S. securities laws. So the SEC is looking at this and saying, we have 60 years of laws that describe what a security is in the U.S., and you guys can come up with a new token or a utility or a SAF, but we've always had the same laws, and we're going to continue to apply those same laws to, uh, to the blockchain industry. And so with a lot of these ICOs, what they're looking at, they're saying, why are people buying these? What is the fundamental re reason people are buying these? Are they buying them for utility? So are you buying it because you want to actually use it for something? So a good example of a utility that Clayton has given is, if I buy a laundry token to go buy, pay for laundry, and I go use that token, that's a utility. I can go use it for something immediately. If I buy 10 tokens for laundry that I can't use today, but I can use in the future if someone builds a laundromat, that might be a security. And so what he's looking at is he's saying, are ICOs today, do they have more of the features of a token, of a utility, or do they have more of the features of the security? And I think everyone here should understand that that's a spectrum. It's not, it's not just you are a security or you're, you're a token. And I think what's happened in the industry is you've had a lot of people try to move the spectrum to say, well, we've got all these functions of utility today. You can do all these great things with our thing today. Therefore, we're not a security. Therefore, U.S. securities laws be damned. We're going to do what we want. And what the SEC has been doing is saying, no, absolutely wrong. You're not. Like, people aren't buying your token because they think they can do a lot of great things with it today. They're buying it because they think they can flip it and sell it for more three months from now. And if that's why they're doing it, we don't care why you think that there's aspects of utility in your, in your token. It's a security. And so in that regard, I think he's probably right. If you look at most ICOs, people are not buying them for their utility today. That doesn't mean that some of these tokens that are out there today, or some of the cryptocurrencies, whatever you want to call them, won't become utility tokens down the road. But it does mean that almost all of them are subject to U.S. securities laws today, which has pretty serious implications. Being the only non-U.S. qualified lawyer here, I'm from Singapore, by the way, um, I, think, I think in Singapore and, and probably the Commonwealth countries, we look at it a little bit differently because I think the Howey test is generally quite broad. So in Singapore, it's not just utility versus securities. It's essentially, you can have 10 usages, current usages, but if you have one aspect of it that represents security, then you are considered a security, you get caught under the Singapore securities law. So I think, 
I think um, it's a bit different on the Asia side of the world. There are actually proper tokens that are not considered securities. So it's really whether they represent shares, debentures, or any other classes that um, the MAS, which is the equivalent of SEC in Singapore, uh, has deemed. And I think I think that's why I think the the negoci not not the thoughts that go behind the utility versus securities. It's very different in Singapore, and that's why we look at it. Uh, very differently in, in the Asia part of the world. Your thoughts about that, uh, Ken? Yeah, sure. so um, I want to be a little contrarian here. Um, I do think that I, I definitely agree that a lot of the ICOs out there today are um, securities, but I also think that um, securities as laws is, is more focused on investment decisions and the transfer of money. And for um, many years, you know, Bitcoin was, was the Genesis block came out January tw 2009. And, you know, the SEC hasn't was really not involved in regulating bitcoins for you know seven eight years until this whole ICO kind of industry took off last year. So um, w w what I'm trying to say is, you know, the the um, uh, as kind of what David mentioned, um, the SEC is not. It, it's not like the Chinese or the South Korean government where it could actually say, hey, all of the uh, all tokens are securities um, because it's bound by. 80, 85 years of, of SEC jurisprudence, um, including under the, the Howey test. Um, and what it cannot do is just draw a blanket line, say everything looks like a security. Um, I, I think it's, it's more of a spectrum, and I think Chairman Clayton has actually acknowledged this in a more recent um, talk he gave at Princeton. You know, okay. and just adding on to that yeah. too, because after hearing a lot of this, yeah. it's great, I know, it's great. Um, when you look at a security, you know, Technically, after market baseball tickets are a security as well. Anytime there's a secondary market when you purchase something of value that's an asset and then resell it, that's a security. But the question is, is whether the SEC is going to rule cryptocurrencies as a security and then sign a non-enforcement memo, which will allow the cryptocurrencies to continue on the markets that they're at. So that's what we're waiting for in the next two to three months. So I know there's going to be a lot of enforcement coming very soon, which will establish more solidified guidelines for the future cryptocurrencies. Okay, thanks, Adam. Sorry, sorry to interrupt there, because we uh, we, we got to keep keep things going. And uh, for those for those of you who, who who may not be familiar with the idea of wh why we why are the lawyers in the room so obsessed with this whole security classification is that because if your ICO token gets classified as a security. Uh, it becomes extremely difficult to list it on an exchange and it makes it very virtually impossible. No exchange will take you. you you're like the guy who has BO and enters a room, everybody leaves. Yeah, so that's, that's why all the lawyers are, are, really excite, uh, are really obsessed about this whole, is a token a uh, security or not? But uh, maybe what we want to hear is a bit more of the exciting stuff. Um, now, I've been told, I don't know this for a fact, but I've been told that, that uh, from a VC's perspective, um, ICOs are extremely attractive because they offer you um, the public markets an opportunity to take part in the venture. Uh, they offer an opportunity for you to make uh, many multiples of your initial investment uh, with no equity dilution. So there are many, many uh, beneficial qualities that an ICO has. And uh, maybe Judy would might want to share a little bit about that. And how, how, how do, you, do you think funds and investors look at, at ICOs? Do you, do, do you find this is a great way to raise capital with no dil dilution? Yeah, I want to like uh, I wanted to like continue the last talk sure, sure. first. Okay. <laughs> uh, I guess I gave him a tough yeah, question. It <laughs> looks like I'm the only investor here, and from my personal invest uh, personal like perspective, I think it's just a uh, uh, definition gaming. It's just a definition game, and uh, the definition comes from SEC. Yeah. So I don't care if it's a utility token or a security token. The only reason you are here to ask a question to all of us because like everyone wants to decrease the legal risk. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, no. So yeah. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I mean, the, the issue you're seeing with every ICO is even if you think you're a utility token, the second the SEC subpoenas you with a 15-page request list for everything you've ever done. You can take every position in the world saying that you're a utility token. Your legal risk has just gone through the roof, and you're going to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to fight them, maybe millions, if you want to try to prove that you're a utility token. And the SEC will go to the mats with you. They'll take you to court, and you'll likely lose. So I, I mean, I think you can say that you think you're a utility token. It's kind of irrelevant if the SEC decides otherwise. Sure. Yeah, but for all the innovation, the first we have the innovation, and then regulator will come uh, after that, right? Right. 
So, so um, Julie, back back to the my earlier yeah. question because I'm really I really want to know this one. Um, do 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 the funds and the investors and the and, and the the capital side? Do do you guys look at, at an ICO as as a great way for a capital raise? Maybe uh, after companies sort of cross Series A, and then now they they're sort of like moving along, and it's it's a great way to do a capital raise without necessarily diluting the efforts of the founders or perhaps of the VCs as well. I'm I'm curious about that. Uh, I think like ICO is not only the way for raising capital. Yeah. yeah, we are talking about the utility token. That means there is a real f functionality after the, the, the token. So uh, you need to look at the details of white paper. Yeah. I know like everyone is um, speculating in this uh, in uh, in this wave, but like if you really study the white paper and you if you know the like uh, real function for the utility uh, for the token. Um, if there is some function after the token, yeah, you can raise the capital uh, you, you, uh, through this way. But if, if there's just a, uh, just a, uh, if you just look at this as a, as a way for raising capital, I think it, uh, it won't sustainable. That, that's, that's a great answer and, uh, and I appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Judy. Yeah. Um, basically what Judy is, is saying, and, and for those of you who are wondering about why, why I'm asking about capital raise and that kind of thing, uh, the question is because let's say we had a utility token and we were using it to buy something. Naturally, I would want the price of that token to be stable because it's being used to purchase either a product or a service. And what, what has been a trend and a possibility is that some companies have been using it uh, as a sort of a disguised capital raise in which it, it starts to resemble a security model more closely. And so from an investor's perspective, it's nice, it's nice to hear that. Thanks, Judy. And uh, for, for Khan, maybe you can share with us a little bit. Um, we're hearing about a lot about regulations going into exchanges. And now, and now the, because if that makes sense, I mean, if you, 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 it's, it's easier to stop a centralized body like an exchange than to try and go out there and hunt down the 10 million ICOs that are brewing in everybody's garage right now. So it's probably easier to go down an exchange. How, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I mean, I definitely agree that that's one of the reasons they've been targeted because without exchanges, there's no liquidity, there's no pump and dump, you can't actually um, do much. Um, the, the, what I want to say about exchanges is, you know, the SEC has been going after them as, you know, exchanges of, of securities. Um, but, you know, another part that I think is also really important is also money laundering and you know, exchanges have to be licensed as uh, money transmitters. Um, and that's something that's kind of under the radar that not a lot of people talk about. Um, so, I mean, I don't really have an opinion as to, you know, why or... or it, I, I well, do, do you think that this is the, the right approach or should we get more regulation, uh, perhaps maybe in, in the overall broader market, maybe the SEC should throw out more clear diktats, if, if you like, as to what, 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 what are the rules of the, of, the, of the game and then how do we play by the rules? Yeah, so, I, so I've had a few people approach me about starting exchanges. So I, I have some opinions on that. I think the way the SEC views this is they already have an established framework for how to regulate exchanges. If you're going to sell a security on an exchange, you have to register. It's pretty simple. And so the, the real debate is just, are you selling securities or tokens? That's it. Like, if you're selling tokens, SEC can't do anything to you. They have no jurisdiction over you. You can do what you want. The second you sell any security and you take a commission for that, you are now a broker dealer in the US and you are subject to a whole litany of regulations. And so the entire debate just comes down to whether or not you're selling utility tokens or you're selling securities. So like, people have been smart, like Coinbase, they won't touch anything that they don't know yeah. for sure is a, is a token because then the SEC can't regulate them and so they can do whatever they want. The second they touch a single security, they are a broker dealer in the US and they're subject to regulation and that's why they don't do it. Now is that smart or not, I don't know, but the, the way the SEC looks at it is they have, from a societal standpoint, we have broker dealer regulations that have been around yeah. for 60 years so why not that's already it? been decided. That's right. Why, why not just go back they're to They're just the enforcing it. So correct. all they're saying is they're saying we don't need to reinvent the wheel, we're just going to enforce existing laws, we just need to decide what's a security and what's a token and from there the law is super clear. Okay, so um, just for, for the information of, of, of everybody out there, uh, in, in 2017, uh, the US was the, the number one market for ICOs. They raised in, in, in excess of about a billion US dollars. Uh, uh, Switzerland was number two at about 350 million, and uh, Singapore came a close second at about 320 million or so. Obviously, that number is going to vary because there's going to be a lot more private ICO sales, which we won't know about because they never really make the exchange. They are based on estimations. Now, with the SEC rules that are coming in, um, as, as most of you will remember, when the internet first started out, there was no legislation. And, and that's why the space was allowed to grow. Obviously, we all know about the internet bubble that popped. But right now, obviously, the regulators are coming in. 
uh, with, when it, with regards to ICOs. So um, I guess this one is for uh, Ying. Uh, I, I, I wanted to ask, do you see that because of increased regulation, given how mobile uh, this whole industry is, I can bring my business elsewhere, I can do my ICO in a different jurisdiction, uh, do you see that there might be a trend where perhaps people say, okay, the, yes, the US market is big, I'll serve the US market, but you know what, I'm going to do my ICO in some place like Switzerland or Singapore. Oh, well. <laughs> okay, but let me go back to the second question because I think it's kind of related sure. to the third question. Um, so in Singapore, actually, we, we obviously have our registered exchanges, etc., which goes back to securities, right? But, but there is a new new bill that's going to come out. It's actually a payment bill. But ironically, if you are a token, uh, you are, uh, you're a non-security token, and you're setting up a crypto exchange that only does non-security tokens, you will be regulated under that. So that is hopefully going to come in soon. And I say hopefully because it does put in certain mechanisms that help safeguard. There are licensing requirements for tech, tech security, for, I mean, the usual AML, KYC, but it's a bit tighter. Um, so I think um, regulations per se is, is, is a good thing. The issue is just jurisdiction and enforcement, right? Because like, like in SEC, if SEC is really strict about it, how is SEC going to enforce a, uh, any regulations against, say, a cryptocurrency exchange that has no office, nobody located in USA? It's about extraterritorial enforcement. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, and, and I got the next question for Judy. And um, basically, as, as an investment, I mean, be it whether you're looking at seed, whether you're looking at Series A, mm -hmm. and let's say one of your portfolio companies decides that, okay, um, we're going to do an, an, we want to do an ICO. You know, we, we, we don't want to raise any more uh, money through the traditional VC route. And how, what are your views on that? And how do you approach it when, when, when a, for instance, a startup or, 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 a, or an early stage company comes to you and says something like that? Uh, in terms of raising capital or in terms of what well, they want to do an ICO, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. But so it's about uh, motivation. First, uh, that, like we will ask, what is the motivation for them to do that ICO, right? So let's if, say, let's say it's basically a disguised capital raise. What do you, just, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> okay, just the capital raise. Uh, okay, just the capital raise. I think, um. Yeah, it is a tough question, but uh, and for the investor, we are not the founder of the. Uh, yeah, that is something we cannot control. Yeah. But if in, we will support all of our portfolio companies in uh, like uh, uh, low risk way, and if they can do ICO, uh, we will be uh, very supportive to uh, for them to to do like a real like. Uh, um, real ICO, like there is okay. a real function after the token, and um, we will suggest uh, to do uh, like uh, like we are suggest that to engage lawyers uh, as soon as possible, and uh, we will uh, tell them what is uh, what will happen after uh, after ICO according to our experience. Uh, uh, to be honest, what I say is uh, it's a very easy way to raise capital. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, if if it, if this is a trend, if ever like Stanford kids who wanted to start a uh, business, uh, I think they will. I think currently they consider ICO first, first and then goes wait accept his 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 dad like <laughs> work in his school or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if this is a trend, like uh, I I think in twenty years, like, uh, Warren Buffett can only pick up the stocks in token market. Yeah. So yeah, I see this is the biggest trend, but we need to do that in a correct way. Yeah. Thanks. And and I appreciate that. And and thanks for your answer, Judy. Uh, this one's for Ken. And and what what I'm wondering is now, ICOs and securities because you you're the securities expert and. Now, I'm going to ask you this question. Now, securities, right, like a share, it, it's only really relevant under certain circumstances. For instance, uh, let's say uh, during an AGM, for instance, when you vote, uh, during a liquidation event, and when, when you, you, you rank for liquidation, and uh, maybe if there's a dividend. Now, if you look at a token, on a token on, on the other hand, even though you have no direct shares in a company, generally your, your average on the street shareholder, he's got no real right because he's a minority shareholder. He can't control the company. He can't force them to give the dividends out. He, he, uh, and in liquidation, you know he's not going to get anything. So what would you say is the real dis distinction between an ICO and perhaps a shareholder? And if anything, as a token holder, I could buy a product or service. 
Um, this goes back to, uh, and I, I'm sure everyone has, has an opinion on this, I think this goes back to what I was talking about earlier about an ICO it involves an investment decision. It has to be, if you create a token out of nowhere, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not a security if you don't sell it. it, it Securities laws is all, is all about how you sell it, who you sell it to, and what you use the money for. Um, you know, I could talk about this for, for ages, but the, the key that I think is the difference between a property and a contract. Um, all of the native protocols out there um, that have a UTXO model um, satisfies the common law kind of definition of a property. And if it's a proper property right, every, every lawyer here I think knows it's, 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 it's yours. Some, it's a computer, it's a piece of paper, it's yours. It's enforceable against everyone in the world. But a contract right is between two parties. And that's what gives a lot of these tokens um, the kind of uh, signs of a security. Um, so if you take ERC20 to tokens, for instance, um, it's not native to the, to the Ethereum blockchain. It's created by a party who wants to create something out of thin air on top of the yeah. Ethereum blockchain. Um, its only utility must be defined in reference to a third party. And that's, and that's where you get the contract right. right. And that's why um, ERC-20 tokens look much more like a security than a lot of native protocols that use the, the UTXO model. So uh, that, That's right. And, and I believe that uh, there was a CFTC chairman, was it, that he, he said that, that uh, Ethereum and Ripple are actually uh, illegally traded securities? I think he, he did mention something like that uh, recently. Uh, I've got the next question. That's, this one's for Adam. Now, um, you know that in terms of like uh, regulation, regulation has a tendency to sort of stifle innovation. You think the SEC is coming down too hard, too fast, or, or it's about just right? Well, right now, I think a lot of them are waiting. I know last week I was over in Singapore and I was actually speaking with the Munchie CTO and CEO about the regulation that got dropped on them. You know, for this company, these are two people who just had a great idea that would scare Yelp. You know, they were trying to create a new application where people were able to rate their restaurants and go out and eat. So because, because the government came down on them, they had their baby taken away. You know, and that was actually a good project. It, they had a solid team and it looked like they actually wanted to build out the ecosystem and help the community. Now when we start looking at all the snatch and grabs that are happening, that's where it gets different. Then you see who is the SEC protecting? The SEC isn't protecting the companies or the legacy companies who are afraid that their businesses are going to go away. The SEC is protecting the average everyday American who recently, in 2017, started opening up separate credit cards and purchasing ICOs and purchasing coins and maxing out those credit cards. When you see a lot of these ICOs are snatching grabs, that average American is left on his butt. And that's who the SEC is protecting. And you know, the USA has a really good reputation of protecting their citizens a little bit quicker. And I say that really relatively speaking, right? Really relatively speaking. But they are waiting to see how this industry evolves a little bit, which is stifling innovation, but I think in the whole, it is helping Americans. Uh, I have a, a, another question for David. Sorry, this one's for David. And um, I would say that many investors and, and indeed many regulators sometimes fail to draw a distinction perhaps between the technology that underlies the blockchain and the ICOs so that it just all gets amalgamated. It's like when you, know, whenever you mention Bitcoin in casual conversation, oh yeah, I know what that is, that's a scam, right? So um, do you think do you think that, that, that there is a, a gross misunderstanding on the part of regulators as well to sort of draw this distinction? I, I'm not referring to the Facebook uh, and with Congress and the Senate, obviously, that's not indicative. I'm, I'm sure the SEC is a lot more ed educated than that. But do you think that the regulators understand the space enough to reg regulate it? I think what you're seeing is the way the SEC operates is they, they issue a bunch of questions to companies in the space and they say, what are you doing? How are you doing it? Why are you doing it? And, and so right now what you're seeing with a lot of the subpoenas is they're just gathering information about how the space works, be that on the technology side, on the regulatory side. I think the distinction between like the underlying blockchain technologies and then like Ripple's technology and Ripple the coin and Ripple the company, I think everyone's conflating them. Investors, like if I invest in Ripple the coin, Ripple the coin might be worthless, Ripple the company might be amazing, Ripple the technology could be worth a lot too. Like those are three different things. None of those are necessarily connected and none of those, like the value that's derived from all of those can be distinct. I think regulators understand that. I, I think players in the industry, like when I'm raising an ICO and I'm going out to people and I'm saying, hey, give me money, 
to do Ripple, for example, Ripple could be amazing and I, that coin could be worthless and the company could capture 100% of the value. And That's like, true. that that could happen. I think the entire industry is conflating those issues. I don't know if the regulators are alone in that. I, I think they're trying to figure it out, but I think everyone's doing it. Okay, uh, next question is for Ying. Um, do you, how do you see the growth of, of, of this market? Do you think that we're going to move towards a space where uh, a token starts to resemble a security more and we're going to start to be okay with that? We're going to start to be comfortable with that. The regulators are going to come in and regulate it according to perhaps a sort of a, a hybrid, modified, uh, improved uh, sort of securities law. Um, I think at least from the Singapore perspective, um, it's very clear. If you're not a security, you don't get regulated by securities law laws. If you are... If you are security, then you get regulated by securities law. So I think that's quite similar in every jurisdiction because the securities laws have worked for time immemorial, right? But um, so I don't, I don't foresee a hybrid legislation model coming in. Um, but I do think that 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 um, securities tokens per se, particularly from the fund perspective, would be quite an attractive um, development. I mean, we, we have received a lot of interest, and in, actually, even in the in mostly European countries, I think, I think that's that's a development that's worth looking at, because it does open up um, investing opportunity investment opportunities to people who are not accredited investors with properly managed funds. But th these would definitely fall within securities. Yeah. So so I think that that to me would be a very interesting development. Okay, uh, next question is for Judy. Um, what I, I understand is that uh, at least basically from the private investors, that means the, the guys who are in the private ICO pools and stuff like that, mm -hmm. I, I, um, what we've noticed is that actually that there's been an increased level of sophistication. I think that your average ICO investor is probably doing a higher level of uh, due diligence than, 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 than perhaps he used to last year in the heady days where you know, 10 out of 10 are gonna be winners. Uh, and, and so we're, we're getting to that point where you know is people are starting to become more discerning. Is that the experience that you have had? Uh, and is that the experience f definitely from the, uh, the the fundraising point of view? Okay, from like um, uh, if you ask the, like the pace of the investment, uh, I think my regular pace is one to two months, and it never changed, uh, no matter the momentum of the market. And for in terms of my IQ, I think it. It can be changed in one year or two years. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, I guess maybe um, I, what I was, was asking in terms of okay, so when you when you see an ICO, for instance, let's say let's say uh, as 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 a capital company, and you guys see an ICO that's coming up, and, and you're approached to say, okay, let, would you like to take part in sort of the pre-ICO round, or would mm -hmm. you like to that kind of thing? What are the things that you're gonna look out for 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 some of the the companies out there who are probably interested to to sort of speak to somebody like you? I think we care like uh, how to make money. In a low risk way, yeah. yeah. So we have some fundamental judgment for every case. So uh, uh, we we believe the fundamental the protocol like the tick we are investor of the tick. Mm -hmm. I think this is the kind of thing can change the whole system. And we started to invest this sector not not starting like last year, but like three years ago. So it's not like a, a flipping uh, investment. It's it's like a value investor okay. yeah, for a long time. So it's not because it's it's not because yeah, you just yeah. want to make a quick buck, right? That's, yeah, 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 clear. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Nobody wants to do that. Now, um, uh, as just for Adam, um, yeah. Uh, what are the the things the the things is that you know with the munchie thing? Because because you you spoke to the munchie the, the munchie guys. The, the Munchie guys, okay. Anyway. Uh, she's a woman. So she's a woman, yeah. So, so you spoke to the people from Munchie. Mm -hmm. and, and then now the SEC c comes in, you know, like literally bashes down the door, says, stop everything, you know, give me all your documents, everybody freeze, everybody get on the floor, you know, that kind of thing. So that's basically what the SEC did. Now, uh, you, do you agree with this sort of interventionist approach? Because there isn't, I mean, do you, do you agree with this sort of like, you know, uh, you, you're coming in? Because, I mean, let's, let's not forget, there was the whole savings and loan scandal, and they did nothing. And and there was the there were so many episodes in the SEC's history where the SEC hasn't actually stepped in, despite where there were glaring, 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 uh, 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 you know, malfeasance, fraud, whatever you name it, it was there. They didn't step in. And with Munchie Token, technically speaking, nobody got hurt yet. And and no, it's possible nobody would have gotten hurt, you know. And and do you agree that they should have come in because they they seem to be moving in. Uh, it seems like constantly at the wrong time. What do you think? I think it all depends. You know, 
I grew up in Palo Alto, so I lived through the, the tech bubble. I was working at Washington Mutual's headquarters in their tax department during 2008, so I was able to see the housing crisis and also see one of the biggest banks in the world crumble. I also had my parents who had their, their savings funds and their retirement savings in Lehman Brothers. There's been a lot of things, and there's been a series and a parade of terribles that have been happening to the US American people within the last 15 years. And right now, this SEC is deciding to try to take one step further, one step quicker than they did previously. Is it right? Is it wrong? I'm not sure. But, <laughs> you know, if there's five people speeding on the highway, a police officer can only catch one. But then they'll be able to be more fully prepared during the next time and the next go around when they see more of those perpetrators happening again. So was Munchie doing anything wrong? I don't know. They had a token offering and they raised the ICO funds just like thousands of other companies in the world right now. But they were one of the targets from the SEC. So they got caught and that's unfortunate. I think there's a Chinese saying that, that, that describes that exact scenario, so, Sa yi jing bai, which is to kill one and you frighten everybody else. <laughs> so, but I, I don't think that that's actually uh, doused the, the sort of enthusiasm for ICOs, if anything. If anything, I, I think that, that lawyers such as us, uh, we, we're finding even more ways to, to help clients to, to sort of meet their angles. And, and I mean, let's be honest, not all companies are, are frauds, and, and the majority are not. Most people don't wake up in the morning and go like, oh, you know what, I'm gonna start, do a startup and just screw everybody of all their money, you know, that's, that's, just not, that's just not what people, I mean, hopefully, that's just not what people do. So, um, as, as, uh, and, and this was for David, uh, what do you think as a lawyer, let's say you've got a good startup, perhaps these post-series A, he comes to you, says he wants to do an ICO. Uh, what is your approach? Go to Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> no, honestly, like I, so one, like so our law firm, like I mainly represent yeah. like hedge sure. funds, venture funds that okay. are investing into this space. So like I, I, I look at it from that perspective. I've had a bunch of people just because of those contacts come to me and ask me about helping with ICOs. We won't do it, generally speaking, because of the risks involved from our law firm standpoint. Because like, if you look at it from a law firm, we're gonna help you raise an ICO in the US. Almost for sure the SEC is gonna subpoena you. Yeah. Almost for sure the SEC is gonna disagree with our analysis on to whether or not you're a utility token or you're a security. So like, uh, it, like, I honestly think that someone looking at that in the US right now, if you're looking at raising an ICO in the US right now, you have to think long and hard what are the benefits. You're accessing a capital market that's huge. It's a great benefit. But we have securities laws in the US on how to raise money doing that. It's series C, series A, series B. Like that's existed for all of time. And so if you want to come in and access our markets and you think that you're going to do it under a different regimen, maybe you can, maybe you can't. There's a lot of risks involved in that. So if I'm looking at a company and they're not based in the US, my honest advice to them would be go to Singapore, go to Switzerland, go somewhere outside the United States, issue your ICO from there, at the very least non-US investors can freely trade that. It doesn't matter if it's a security in the US. As long as those non-US investors are trading outside the US, they can trade it all they want. You have liquidity on that side of things. You then have to look at the analysis on the US side of things and say, well, if we also want access to the US market and we're issuing out of Singapore, what do we do? Potentially, you then have a security. You're not going to have liquidity on the US side. So I think people here need to understand that if, if you have a security, your liquidity disappears. You cannot trade that on a secondary market. You have to have another exemption to trade it the second time you try to trade it. So if I buy a security that's privately held, I can only sell that to someone else who's an accredited investor in an unregistered unre offering that qualifies under US securities laws. You cannot do that on exchange. It's almost impossible. I mean, there's some secondary exchanges that try to do that. There's secondary markets for shares like Uber, there's share like privately held large companies in the US, but it's really hard to do. So if you're a company looking at that, I think like the smartest decision, offer offshore, make sure that everyone else in the US isn't tainted by US laws, and then ring fence your US investors and they can deal with the securities laws here. Well, I think it goes back to the extra territory issue that I spoke about just now at the end of the day. So yeah, so I think, I think you have to find, you have to be prepared to give up the US market, I think if you're doing an ICO, given the current circumstances um, and also China, so. 
Okay, uh, uh, Judy, from 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 your perspective, uh, and especially from Tanhua Capital as well, and, and as well as the, the the Chinese government's approach towards cryptocurrencies and ICOs, I mean, their their approach is quite clear. It's just a it's an outright ban. And do you think that that in some way kind of uh, sort of slows down the growth of your own native companies in in, in China in their ability to because you know that uh, I've spoken to some uh, VC some uh, investors and what they say is that they have a huge band of companies which have tremendous value. But they can't get them up to the level where they could list on a stock exchange. Mm. But they'd be perfect candidates for the ICO. Yeah. But they're just wringing their hands because they, they can't do much. What do you think? Uh, go to Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. okay so yeah. I, I guess the uh, yeah. if it, there was a takeaway from this uh, session is just go to Singapore. Okay. <laughs> but uh, we're not here to, to just. Uh, sell, we're here to actually just. We want to shed light on what are some of the investors' viewpoints. What are some of the the, the lawyers' viewpoints, and in terms of where do you think regulation is going? And uh, because right now there is uh, quite a degree of uncertainty. I think everybody's just sort of walking on eggshells. And would, would you? Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. Uh, Adam has something to say about that. So I know in the past month I've been to three different countries and one of the things that have been happening in every single country, every single hub that I've been going to, is I've been seeing communities and ecosystems of co-working spaces that have to do with blockchain technology. And some of these companies, they're being formed in that country as a nonprofit because they want to focus on policy. Because they know the change within this blockchain industry or you know, the US government calls it distributed ledger technology because blockchain is a taboo word. Is we need to regulate from within and that includes a purge. So I know there's, gonna, there's, some, there's a blockchain hub in Singapore. There's a blockchain zoo in Bali. I know there's a blockchain embassy over in Atherton, California. And a lot of these founders, they want to come together and act as one unified voice because in order for, to add legitimacy to this industry, we do need to clean out the bad actors. Sorry, yeah, you wanted to add something to that too? So I, in our representation of a lot of people who invest in this space, I think the ICO does represent a great way to raise money really quickly. And what's unclear to me is whether or not it's going to create long run value for anyone investing in this space. I think most people who are investing in this space, for now at least, seem to be looking at projects where they can turn around and flip it within four to four months to a year. Most of, even my investors, my hedge funds, my venture funds are looking at and saying, Look at the liquidity I can get in this. I can turn around and flip this to the public markets in this amount of time. And so like, if you're asking a question, is the US regulation going to stifle long run innovation? It might stifle the ability to flip a project that I don't know if it has long run value or not. Uh, if you're looking at whether or not the underlying blockchain companies and where that value is going to get created, I'd argue that it's still happening in the US. Uh, despite the SEC. Now, you might have a huge slowdown in the number of ICOs, but I think you're going to have venture capital and private markets step up and fund blockchain projects that actually can do something good. Like, blockchain is going to do amazing things, but I think they're going to get the funding that they need if they can do really amazing things. Now, whether or not the ICO is the mechanism that they end up using, maybe not, but I don't know if that's going to hurt the US. Okay, I can. I, had, I have a question. Um, when, it, when it comes to uh, the tokens themselves, do you think that even if it, if it has a sound utility, once the, the tendency for a lot of these tokens is that once they get onto an exchange, that price just goes bonkers, you know, it's just off the charts. And now, does that necessarily take away from, add to the utility? Because uh, like I said, if I was going to a laundromat, I don't want my laundry to cost a buck today and 10 tomorrow, then I do all my laundry today and then never do it again. Mm -hmm. So uh, what do you think about that? No, that, that actually goes to the heart of the Howey test because, you know, if I have a security, uh, sorry, if I have a token out there right now and a TV guru talks it up and says, hey, this is the new big thing that's going to be needed by a billion people around the world, everyone's going to buy, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go through the roof. If the next day, if a competitor comes along and makes my token totally useless, does that mean it's no longer security? Does it change day by day depending on third party circumstances? It's very, very um, vague. And I think Clayton um, uh, kind of talked about this earlier when, when he was at Princeton two weeks ago. It's, it's, it, it could be a security today, it could be a security tomorrow. It's a lot of facts and circumstances that you have to look at. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. But I think it will converge uh, like uh, maybe 10 years later 
the volatility of the token market cannot uh, can can be not like uh, this for like long years. Yeah. Okay. Well, well. To be fair, um, some some of some some of the VCs I've spoken to, some say that we're in the early stages. Some say uh, because of the way the blockchain infrastructure is structured, uh, we we are like probably 1996, 98 in terms of the internet, just just for a uh, juxtaposition. And and then there are some, of course, who say that we're in the midst of the bubble and the bubble's going to burst in the next six months, but then the next six months come along and suddenly there's a whole new bunch of crypto millionaires, okay? So um, what do you guys think? Okay, this is open to anybody. What do you guys think? Uh, where, where are we in terms of, ju not just the technology, but uh, and the market as a whole? Are, are we, because we're all in this room today, are we all the, the early adopters? Are we the ones who are getting on the ground floor? Or are we like, so a little bit late, little late to the party? We're not, we're not, we haven't missed it, but maybe we could still get a little bit of that upside, which is just completely irrational. So like, if you look at Bitcoin's history, I think we've seen like a 70% drawdown since December. So in the last three months, it's worth 70% less than it was worth three months earlier. Is that, I mean, if, if you think that's not the end of a bubble, that, that's worse than the dot-com drawdown from 2001 on. Uh, I don't know, like, it, it seems like the market in Bitcoin moves at like 50 times what other markets move at. So like it can reinflate super quick and deflate. I think at some point these projects have to have fundamental value. At some point it cannot be I'm buying Bitcoin because tomorrow someone's going to need it more and I'm going to be able to flip it. At some point someone's going to look at that and say, can I use Bitcoin today? And if I can't use it today, it's not worth anything. And I think for now, at least we're at the stages of these investments where everyone doesn't know where they are. And that's where a lot of the value is derived. Like, are we at the early, early stages of Bitcoin and it's going to be worth hundreds of millions of dollars? Personally, I doubt it, but maybe. And I think no one can legitimately tell you yes or no. And that's why I think, like, you see the reinflation and the deinflation because, like, for investors looking at it, that thing could be worth a million or zero, and there's no, there's no fundamental analysis that can lead you in either direction validly. Yeah, I can. Yeah, I was just gonna say. I think it's 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 here to stay, not because of investors or securities laws or anything. It's because. What I think blockchain really creates and allows people to do is to create um, something that's 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 hard to create, which is trust, which is it's very hard to to kind of duplicate that. Um, you know, something else that blockchain creates that is again very high level is uniquely digital assets. Um, and that's something you you couldn't do before. So I think it's here to stay, but it's gonna. I mean, everyone is saying this, but just to kind of repeat it, but you know, I think we're at the stage where you know a lot of the 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 garbage is going to go away and and we're going to see you know the facebook's and amazon's um kind of emerge no i i think one of the things that i said at a recent um at another panel that i went to is that uh, and that was a room full of entrepreneurs and i said you know don't just do an ico because you want a capital raise the effort and the time involved is just too much right but you do it because you decide whether there's something in there that will benefit your underlying business Say, for example, if you're a social media company, the marketing effort you put in will boost your entire project, for example, right? Or if you're in e-payments, international payments, that might be something subject to regulations, of course. So I think, and currently the, the projects and the leads that we're getting, it's, it's, a, lot, um, it's a lot more in-depth than what we were getting just three months or six months ago. I think people start realizing that, look, hey, this is getting serious and with more institutional money coming in because you know the funds are also getting into the play um, they stop looking at just oh whether I can flip this in four months in six months and eight months they still look at fundamentally whether this is a good project right and I think Julie, uh, we'll, and Julie will probably we'll, we'll end off with you because uh, I've been told that the time's up but I, I mean we sh I'm sure everybody would wish this could go on all, all night uh, but we'll just leave uh, we'll just end off with Judy yeah, uh, it's our firm's view that uh, the blockchain is like um, 10x, at least 10x than the internet bubble. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, because it reduces the uh, reduce the cost of credit, uh, cost of trust. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it reduce it changes the company structure, and uh, it can make the pool become rich. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, you 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 heard it here first. Um, I think <laughs> like a regulation will be very trivial. Yeah, for okay. the, yeah, God of you. Like, so the, 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 what you're saying is that regulation will be like a, a, a trivial... Like, uh, 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 we want to do uh, in a legal way for ICO, for all of those things. We want to try to... Uh, we are always trying to decrease our legal risk, but uh, like uh, regulator can never stop like... Uh, 
that. I, I like that. Yeah. Yes, the regulators so the can never stop us. Yeah, that's right. Okay, folks. Uh, thanks, thanks for coming in uh, th this evening. Um, I, I hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, well, you heard it here first. Um, we are not quite. The bubble hasn't burst clearly. I mean, uh, if you go outside, there's, I think there's a screen outside with the Bitcoin price. It's still about nine thousand US dollars. So you know, get in while you can. I guess uh, this is not financial advice. Uh, but anyway, uh, let's just thank our panelists. Uh, uh, Ying from Taylor Vinters in Singapore. Uh, we've got. Um, D David from uh, uh, Chartres and Frises. Well, I'll, I'll get that right, okay? And then we, uh, we've got Adam. Adam Giradovac with Giradovac Law in Palo Alto, California. And we've got Mr. Kenson from Fenwick and West. And of course, Miss Judy Ann, uh, who's from Tanhua Capital. And uh, myself, Patrick Tan from Taylor Vinters as well. It has been a privilege and a pleasure to have you guys uh, this evening. Thank you so much for your time. We hope you enjoy that.